Hello, everyone. I'm Miriam Bale, and I am the artistic director of Indie Memphis. And welcome to the Indie Memphis Film Festival. We are kicking off today with two events. Uh, at the same time, we're doing an in-person screening in Memphis at Shelby Farms, and we're having a live Q&A with the director of the Giverny document, Single Channel, Jatavia Gary. Jatavia, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. I'm going to just say a few things. Jatavia has an amazing uh, uh, bio, but I'll just say she's the, she's directed um, films including The Ecstatic Experience and The Evidence of Things Not Seen. She has a background in acting, post-production, and archival assistant, um, and as an assistant editor. Um, she was a Radcliffe Harvard Film Study Center follow, fellow, and she was a co-founder of the New Negress Film Society. Um, uh, welcome, and let me just say, um, as I've said publicly, I love your film so much. Thank you for making it. Thank you so much, Miriam. I'm really, I'm happy. I'm happy that the film is getting um, a great reception from specifically from the audience who I was talking to, but also from everyone who, who is watching it and who's seeing it. So I'm, I'm just grateful. I wanted to ask um, just some basic clarification questions. This is the film that we're showing in Indie Memphis is the Giverny document, single channel, um, differentiating, it, differentiating it from uh, an installation that you had at Paula Cooper Gallery and um, other places. Can you talk a little bit about the difference and how in the experience of the film and the installation for people who haven't experienced it that way? Yes, so initially the work, even before we got to the three channel, there was a, a an initial work called Giverny One, Negress and Bial. And this is a seven minute experimental film, very short. It's basically, if you've seen the film, if you've seen the, the Giverny document, it is basically the garden footage and the Diamond Reynolds Facebook Live cell phone footage. The, that montage where we're jumping back and forth and there's the Louis Armstrong track and the glitches and the flowers. It's just basically a kind of a seedling, a, a bud in which everything else kind of flowers from. Um, so we start with, the, with Giverny 1, Negresso Imperial in 2017. And then I had the opportunity, I have a, a French gallery, Gallery Franck Elbaz, and they invited me to do a presentation in Paris and 2019 and this was I felt like the opportunity for me to really continue with the conversation of what the Giverny the whole Giverny suite was 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 expounding on which was of course the safety of black women linking uh, our safety to that of the country and the land and the violence against our bodies and the violence against our lives linking that to you know western imperialist campaigns uh, the the legacy of enslavement, so forth and so on, but also really thinking about our contributions despite this kind of brutal violence, like in, in, in light of all of those things, look at how brilliant, look at how you know phenomenal we are in terms of what we are contributing to the cultural landscape and the creative world. So I mounted the, the three channel, right? So we go from seven minute film to three channels of 40 minute displays all happening at one time. Uh, so in addition to the garden footage and the Diamond Reynolds footage, we have, of course, Nina Simone giving this amazing rendition of Albert Morris's feelings, which is a kind of emotional, you know, tour de force, uh, but also you see this brilliance and prowess put on display. Uh, we also have uh, imagery, of you know the direct animation footage that bookends the opening and closing of the film and of course we have the interview footage with the women and the girls the black women and girls on 116th street so we go from the short to a four channel presentation which was at gallery franck elbaz the hammer museum shout out to aaron cristobal and paula cooper gallery in in new york um, so it's a it's a more immersive experience when you step into the gallery space. There are three very large projections 
Uh, and the Givrini document single channel is the middle projection. Oh, I see. The, the center piece, which is what I say is the meat of the film, which has, you know, all of the interviews, uh, the, the garden footage. On the left and the right, we have supplemental imagery. So we have outtakes from interviews. Uh, we have further scenes, recreations from uh, Chronicle of the Summer, which is what the interviews are referencing. So we have further imagery that we can't see on the middle screen. If you've seen the three channel, you've seen the full experience, the suite of films. And all of the films are inside of one another. It's like a film within a film within a film. So if you see the three channel, you're, you're seeing everything and you're surrounded by sound and imagery. A purple or indigo is a washing the space. Uh, there's a, a antique settee, like a sofa that's tilted. So there's objects in the space as well. About 30 or 40 frames on the wall that are kind of simulating or gesturing towards a French salon or, you know, a black grandmama's house, you know, where all the pictures are on the wall. So it, we're, we're attempting to create a lived space, a lived environment, but that is askew, that is non that has been tipped on its axis. Um, so thinking through place and belonging uh, and space, who can take up space and what happens when certain bodies occupy spaces. Uh, I'm so regret not seeing the installation at the Hammer, which was just before lockdown, wasn't it? I think. Yes. Yes. <laughs> In fact, we were scheduled to be extended for like another week or two weeks, and we had to unfortunately close a little bit early. We were up for maybe a little bit over. Actually, no, the Hammer was going to go on until May, in fact, um, but we had to close it in March. Uh, we had to go out a week early in, in um in New York. But the good thing is there's always opportunities to restage that. There are, you know, people are actually always asking for that three channel now. So I'm just happy to be able to move in both of these spaces, whether it be the film world, you know, or the art world and, and be able to create works that are, you know, I guess malleable and fluid enough to be able to exist in both of those spaces. Can you, um... I, I want to talk about the film that we're screening, the single channel, but I also would love to ask you about your um, your journey from acting. You started studying acting to editing and post-production to this, to installations and to creating spaces. And how um, has that like has that been liberating to you? And how so? I think, you know, I, I've always, of course, I, I feel like any type of like making that I'm able to do when I'm able to expand, you know, into different mediums, modes, venues, genres. In fact, that's why I don't really shy away from the term experimental, even though I feel like it's inadequate enough. It doesn't really capture exactly what I and a number of experimental filmmakers are doing, but I don't shy away from it because it is, of course, to me, a kind of disavowal of any categorization, even though people attempt to make it a category. Um, but I'm interested in existing as an artist. You know, of course I make films. That's probably the primary mode of expression that I'm working through now. But initially I was an actor as a young person I'd say probably from like 12 to about 23, 24, studying in the theater. And that to me laid a lot of groundwork around what does it mean to make, to tell a story? Also, what does it mean to work collaboratively, uh, to come together and everybody is doing their part in order to make sure that this thing gets up and gets out. Um, and so, you know, as a young person, I was really quite blessed to be able to have this kind of arts education um, that gave me a really strong foundation on what is what it means uh, to, to take my craft seriously. Um, so, you know, yeah, when I transitioned to New York as a college student, it was a little destabilizing. You know, I'm coming from a space, you know, big fish in a small pond and really enjoying all of the opportunities, opportunities that are coming my way that are based on my talent. 
But when you get out into the world, it's not simply based on your talent. So you have to contend with, you know, power structures, of course, uh, money. You have to contend with, of course, white supremacy. You have to contend with misogyny and all of these things. Um, and so to me, the shift from acting to directing and even editing was about me attempting to grasp onto some sort of agency and autonomy over my artwork, over my story, over how I was rendered, over how I was represented. Um, and so, you know, I was seeing discrepancies, you know, on, on how I felt like the reality of a thing was based on what I was being asked to do. Um, so, you know, like sitting in the director's chair is, 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 is a powerful position. Cutting, sitting in the editor's chair is a powerful position. Um, so to me, that's what that transition was about. And I, but I draw a direct through line to those early years as a student actor, as a college student, as a waitress in New York auditioning and waiting tables and, you know, one audition to the next. And like, there's a, there's a straight line of uh, experience and of, you know, knowledge that I have accumulated on the road that has helped me get to how, to where I am now. And I think that of course spills over to creating space, right? When you're talking about installation, are you not talking about set building? Are you not talking about mise-en-scene? You know, there, it, there's so much overlap in, in all of the things that I'm doing. So I'm just grateful for that initial experience, those initial, you know, confidence building and initial opportunities to learn, you know. So shout out to those early theater teachers. Um, that's great. And, you know, you've talked about this through line. There's also been a through line. Um, you mentioned doc experimental. There's also been a continued through line of documentary, but maybe a slightly ambivalent relationship to it in some ways or a critical relationship to it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, tell me about, uh, for instance, just on the most true documentary, um, uh, the most like archetypal documentary bits, the interviews with the women on, in Harlem. Um, tell me about your interview style because it's so different than a typical. It's so not um, uh, blank and neutral. It's so yeah. warm. And tell me about that. Well, you know, <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad that it's warm. And it's, to me, it is, you can see, you know, the, <laughs> what, what I'm, what I'm doing in that film is basically kind of like, it's a nod, of course, to Chronicle of the Summer, but it's also a kind of wink to my uh, graduate school days. They used to send us out on the streets of New York. I went to SVA. And they were like, y'all are gonna go do some Vox Populi. So break up into groups and go do these interviews on the street. And we would be like, okay, you know? Um, and so that's, that's where I kind of cut my teeth, you know, doing those sorts of things. Um, but of course, you're taught in school, they want you to kind of, you know, embody a certain position, embody a certain comportment. And I, of course, throw that all out of the window because, you know, I'm trying to talk to a bunch of black women and I need them to be comfortable with me I need them to be real with me and I don't need to be, you know, fucking Diane Sawyer or whoever, you know, I just need to be myself <laughs> or this kind of version of myself that's wearing a wig and like, but I, I definitely wanted to make people feel comfortable. Um, not everybody is comfortable in front of a camera immediately. Some people are, but not everybody is. And initially when I was out there, not everybody wanted to, to be engaged with, you know, so I had to really you know, I had to be warm and it, it, it wasn't an act. Like I was definitely like kikiing out there on the block with these women and, and these girls, you know, because I know them, you know what I'm saying? Like, I know, I know these people. Um, so it was important for me in order, in order to make, the, you know, like if you're making a documentary, you have to make real connections with people. You know, like that's important. Like the relationship building is first and foremost. And I think we, we forget that sometimes, especially if you are coming from outside of somebody's community and deciding that you want to train your camera on them. You know, it's, it's easy to forget that. But if I'm inside of my community, I need to of course make sure um, that I am meeting people 
where they are for real, for real, looking them in their eyes and connecting with them. So I'm glad that that warmth came across. It does. And it's, and it's, it comes across in part because, um, because it, it's so unusual within the documentary format, I think. And so necessary in this instance, the reason why you get, you, um, get the honesty and connection and vulnerability that you do. So, um, but yeah, sadly unusual. Um, but I wanted to ask you, um, was this, this is just a, a small question, but was it intentional to film in winter when people are wearing their winter coats or was that just happenstance? Because it ends up being this juxtaposition of like summer and winter. Yeah, no, it was happenstance. It was a nice, accident it was like oh because you know the interviews came last everything else was kind of in its place um but the interviews required you know i can do i can do a lot of things on my own uh but the interviews required me crewing up you know and like organizing like you know 16 17 people in order and and you know permits and all of that shit so you know i had to do a lot of planning and so it just kind of that's where it fell on the camp on the calendar um, but I, I think it, it is great that there is this juxtaposition in terms of like uh, temporal space or, you know, like uh, um, climate as well, you know, because you see, I don't know, it, to me, it was important to just express a vastness and an expansiveness, whether it be me occupying several subject positions, me interviewing several women, me occupying several spaces, you know, it was important just to kind of like, show expansiveness because when we think about black women in fact some of the critique i've gotten for this film is oh it's kind of narrow she only talks to black women and i'm just like that's not narrow <laughs> it's crazy. and tony morrison says when i say people that's who i mean you know <laughs> black people um and so to me black women isn't that's an expansive group uh, and it was important for me to illustrate that not just to people outside of the community but to us you know, like when we talk about black women, we're talking about millions of people, various ethnic groups from all different parts of the world, speaking many different languages, intergenerational, trans diaspora. Like this is a, an expansive group of people who literally are the backbone. Like we're all we got, but we're also all everybody else has got. You know what I'm saying? Don't give yes. me stuff. Don't give me. <laughs> Oh, like beginning um, and the end. <laughs> <laughs> it's all so true. Um, I want to ask you something else about, there's like a, a sound effect in there, especially in the garden that um, I don't have a reference point for, except for like the witch reruns. Like it's like ding, ding, ding. It's almost like, it reminds me of magic. It's a sort of uh. ding, 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 ding. And I want to ask you about that, about, and you know, you have you going in and out and there's a sense of magic. Was that something that was intentional? I mean, I'm always courting the surreal, you know. I, in fact, you know, Afro-surrealism is a, a kind of re recurring theme uh, and aesthetic in the work and a lot of the work. Um, there's a kind of conjuring, there's a haunting that of course is permeating through most of the work through our use of archival, uh, through our use, through our like engagement with a certain subject matter, whether it be death, violence, the past, history. Um, so I think you're referencing a kind of glitching effect, either that or perhaps a sound that is coming from the music. The music was a chopped and you know, uh -huh. version of Louis Armstrong's La Vie en Rose. So it might be from the track, but it also might just be a kind of glitch sound. And it was important for me to utilize the glitch as well as the kind of direct animation flower material that you're seeing as a portal almost that shifts us from one space to the next. We're in the garden and then the glitch and the flower material occur. And then we're in this kind of devastating nightmare that Diamond Reynolds is experiencing. I wanted us to be kind of transported and fragmented in a way, psychologically kind of destabilized. Um, because to me, if we're talking about the precarity of black life, black women's life, black men's life, black children's life, that sort of, that sort of danger is, 
it can happen at any moment. It's a kind of fast break. It's a kind of slippage that occurs. Um, but also like what is happening internally? What is happening in terms of time with black folks? I'm playing with time in a way that I feel like references black folks very kind of unconventional relationship with time. Uh, and that's why rhythm is so necessary. Um, and that's why it's like we're jumping back and forth, you know, in time, in the future, in the past, et cetera. There is no kind of linear grasp on, on the temporal plane. So that glitch, that magic, that kind of signal is in many ways a kind of gesture towards that, but also to the immaterial world like the ghostly presence, the, the, the thing beyond the veil. Um, so yeah, I embrace all of that. I want to change the molecules in people's bodies when they're watching it. I want them to be a little bit shaken up, you know? <laughs> Anything I can yeah. do to get them there is, is, is full, full use. I think that's it. The it was all of that and the glitching, the glitching, which was a sort of portal, sort of transporting like through time, as you said, and space and um uh and one of the um I feel like it's almost like a hinge of some of the themes, but um is the Nina Simone footage. Um can you talk a little bit about um how the the connecting tissue of the Nina Simone footage. Yeah, there's so much that she's doing in um, in, in the film. Um, to me, she's just really superb. When I think of an artist, when I think of a model of what an artist should be, the type of courage they should embody, the type of commitment to their craft that they should embody, uh, the type of dedication to their people, and uh, like there's a fearlessness there, you know, not only was she like brilliant in terms of her prowess, but she was cur courageous in what she was saying and how she was aligning herself politically, but also formally she was courageous. Um, Nina Simone would engage with the source material of other musicians uh, and other writers uh, and take their works and completely transform them. And that's something that I feel like I do as well in terms of the archive. Um, there's a kind of fabulation, a critical fabulation that's occurring in my work um, as, as Ms. Hartman notes and, and has discussed in her work. So to me, Nina in some ways is doing that as well. She's occupying multiple subject positions by way of her engagement with source material. Also this kind of deep well of emotionality that she is exhibiting here. It's kind of emotional courage, emotional intelligence that she's showing us at the, at the piano and beckoning, urging the audience to be in on this, to not just be passive observers, but to also meet her there in this plane. That's something that black women are also kind of at the forefront of, like, you know, who's going to, who's going to be human, you know, <laughs> who's going to step up and do, do the human thing, the courageous thing. We're always looking towards uh, black women to do, but also her contentious relationship with um, the audience uh, and her relationship, of course, to Europe and France specifically, you know, going over there and being met with a sound of like praise and being lauded because of her brilliance. Um, but also having to wrestle with the power dynamics of being a black woman performer in front of largely white audiences and the demands that they place upon her and the boundaries that she erects in order to protect herself. Um, so to me, I'm thinking about all of these things, you know, when I place her specifically singing this song about what feelings, about the emotional life. Uh, and then there's the things that she's saying, all the kind of like editorializing she's saying, you know, about how horrible it is to even have to write a song like that. You know, like she's lamenting the state of the world, the state of our relational dynamics with one another. It's just to me very rich material. And it's a video that I would revisit over and over again, you know, since I was probably like in my early twenties. So I'm a little bit obsessed, you know, with her. Her, her talk back to the audience. Yeah, you can, why don't you, what does she say? Why don't you clap or? Yeah, clap. 
<laughs> yeah. What am I here yeah. for my help? <laughs> Give me something. Yeah. Feed me, feed me, feed me is one of the things she said. They're shy. No, totally. And it's a courageousness, but an um, emotional examination too, when she looks and at the song. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. The most courageous is vulnerability sometimes. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, did, did you, taking a play from your book, did you feel safe in France in the, in those gardens? Did you feel safe in France? Um, I felt safe in the garden. Um, but a lot of the sh filming that I did was also in the countryside. So this is a really small town, Giverny. It's about an hour okay. away from Paris. And I was there for two months as part of the artist residency called the Terra Foundation for American Arts. And, you know, overall, I had a good time. If we're talking about artist residencies, it's one of the, the, the top, you know, like there, there's resources. Let's just say that. And I met some really smart people. And I was able, of course, to do this work. But there were moments where I felt decidedly unsafe. In fact, that's where the, the, the thought process or even the conceit behind this film comes from because I was there in a luxurious European setting and was feeling my embodiment 100%. Not only that, I was feeling, I was going through changes emotionally and psychologically because you know I'm logging on to the internet and I'm seeing the violence that really, really shaped the summer of 2016. There's Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, the Pulse nightclub shooting. There were a number of like recurring instances of just like extreme violence. And usually I'm at, I'm connected to my community. I'm able to like meet up with folks and process this, but I was away. But there was also an incident with a jogger filming by myself in the countryside in a very desolate space. And there's this man jogging and he passes and then he, he decides to loop around and talk to me and, you know, petition me for kisses and, you know, let me film you, let me take your picture, you know. And so I, there was definitely a moment where I felt like I might need to fight this man. Um, but luckily it didn't go that way, thank God. Um, but it did spark in me this idea or this notion around safety and how I needed to protect myself here. Um, and, and that there's a certain amount of visibility that comes with being the only black person in the space. There's a certain amount of vulnerability that comes with being the only black person in this space. So I was definitely feeling my body and feeling very vulnerable. Uh, and that is how I got to even thinking about what does it mean to be safe uh, in various spaces? And what does it mean to take up space in places that were not originally designed for you or with you in mind? Great. Um, I want to ask, you said a couple of times early on, you said something about budding and you're wearing that beautiful floral dress. And obviously there's that flower um, animation. Can you tell us, tell us how the, how did you do the flower animation Is that this, on the film? Yes, this is a, uh, of course, you know, a direct animation technique. Um, I'm thinking Stan Brackage, right? So you, when I first arrived, I was not filming anything for like a month. I wasn't doing anything but like drinking rosé and like trying not to lose my mind. But <laughs> I would walk around the gardens or the, the adjacent landscape, which was, you know, beautiful, of course, very bucolic, wildflowers everywhere. And I would pluck petals from the flowers and read about Claudia Jones and uh, and then I decided to like adhere the petals to a clear film strip. So what you're seeing are flower petals and leaves from that actual space. You're seeing the biological material from that space adhere to film strips. And so when you place it in a projector, the light of course shoots through it and you see a kind of almost microscopic view of this material and it looks you know, for a while I would let some of it sit and so mold is growing on it. <laughs> Sometimes, it, you know, it's looking very decayed, but it is another view of the garden through a different perspective. Uh, and I'm using this, of course, as the portal, but I'm also using it to kind of give some opacity to Philando Castile's body. I refuse the view of this body, of his dying body. That's not something that I'm interested in showing. So I've I use this flower material to cover 
uh, and you only hear what's happening in the car after he is shot. Uh, and so the flower is, of course, we're thinking about the cycle of life and death, and of course, the beauty and the devastation in life and death. Um, but also it's just another POV of the garden, a very kind of intimate, close up, microscopic view of the landscape. Well, um, we're gonna open it up to questions. So if you are watching on Eventive or YouTube, um, please type questions into the comments and they'll get to us. Um, uh, but I'll ask one more question, or this is more of a comment. Um, the, um, one of our Memphis uh, film critics, uh, John Bifus, uh, um, in something he wrote today, described your film as something new, the political uncanny. And I wonder how you respond to that description and or what has been your favorite description of this, of this very unique film? Um, I don't know what my favorite is. There's, <laughs> there's a lot. Um, I'm grateful that someone says this is something new. That's always what I'm trying to do. Even if I'm using a similar technique from a different film of mine or from a film that I have seen, the way that I'm cobbling things together, the way that I'm assembling things, I'm hoping to always come with the energy of, and now for something completely different. You know, I want people to say, wow, I've never seen anything like that before. Even if it's a mess to them, even if they're like, ah, it's too loud and I don't like the soundtrack and why is she only talking to black people? I want them to at least think, well, I've never seen anything like that. You know, like that's really, that's really what I'm getting at. And I, I know that as an artist, the job is to constantly change, to be innovative and to be inventive. So truthfully, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to make these sort of kind of collage, assemblage films, because I feel like it's becoming a bit of a trend, you know, <laughs> no see, no shade. But I think it's cool for people to, you know, get a little bit of, get a little YouTube happy, get a little archival happy and, you know, make something. Um, but it's not easy. I want people to know that it is a kind, there's thought behind it. There's a conceptual process behind it. And it's hard, it's quite difficult to do. But if you're in the zone, if you're tapped in then you can make something new, you can make something that no one has ever seen before. And that is, uh, inspiring to other people to the point where they're going and trying to replicate, you know, that. So I, I, I like that, a political uncanny. And I do think it's important to speak to the moment, you know, like I'm, I'm one, that's one thing that Nina is very serious about. One thing that I take to heart, like, I'm not just here to get rich. I'm not just here, you know, to be a, an influencer, you know, I'm, I'm like, I want to say something with the art so that it can be timeless so that 50 years from now, Someone watches it and says, wow, okay, if that's what was going on then, oh, maybe I can think, think through my predicament right now in a way that is, is, is thoughtful. Like this is, can be instructive to me or this can co-opt my experience. And I can say, wait, I'm not crazy. You know, like they were going through this then and this is what someone came up with. This is how someone responded. So it can be instructional, um, but also like soothing perhaps to or galvanizing to people who see it. So if you're moving away from this collage style, is your, can you say anything about your new film? Is it quite different than, than what we've seen? I don't know. I, I haven't fully moved away from the collage style, so I can't. <laughs> I think it's a pivot that is coming. I'm definitely making a short right now that is a bunch of disparate elements that are collaged together because it's, it's beautiful and that's kind of what it's, it's calling for. Also the collage thing I can do, I can do it here by myself in my apartment. Like I don't have to crew up and you know, the limitations of the current moment. Um, but looking ahead, there are elements from the past films. There's some direct animation elements. Uh, there might be a few montage elements, but yeah, it, it, it is different in that there's going to be, it's a longer film, first of all. It's like a feature, probably around 90 minutes, at least 80. Um, and there's the archival impulse remains, 
but there, I feel like it might look a little bit more like a traditional dock with these bursts of fancy and surrealism. It may not be, you know, one entire stream of consciousness, <laughs> but it's, it's gonna be a little bit more structured, I presume. I'm not really sure because I'm in it right now and it takes shape as you're in it. So I can only say so much. Oh, great, okay, so um, thanks for sharing that with us. So a question from Maddie, um, thank you for your film. I'd love to hear about how you think about space in your film, the space of the garden, the space of the street. Yeah. I mean, I think that space is contentious when we talk about quote unquote democratic space, you know, who is allowed to exist freely and feel safe as they navigate the space. Usually it's not people who look like me. Um, so for me, taking up space was a kind of deliberate act, a provocation, especially in the garden, you know, like when Claude Monet was designing that garden, he didn't design that necessarily for models. He would invite his friends, his, you know, his contemporaries to come in and paint. And sometimes they would bring models, but those models didn't look like this, you know, they weren't looking like me. And Monet, of course, was painting the lily pads. He was catching the light reflecting off of the pond. He wasn't concerned uh, about, you know, bodies, definitely not the bodies of black women. Um, so, you know, I was in some ways complicating the relationship of that particular space um, with the histories of, you know, systems of violence, imperialism, uh, which was very active and still is active, but of course, very active during Monet's time. You know, you have these imperialist and colonial campaigns all over the globe stemming from European aggression. So. You know, I was attempting to conceptually, you know, make some connections. What does it mean when a body like this comes into a space like that? You know, all you, know, you have to contain with what comes up and pops up in your head as the viewer. And you start thinking about the black figure in Western art. Some people think about, you know, black women in, in, in regards to the period of enslavement or um, people who see this work, they come up with all different sort of responses. But for me, it is about kind of complicating our relationship to quote unquote democratic space, our safety within that, but also our relationship as black people to the land, which is contentious because of this kind of natal alienation that stems from enslavement, but also being forced to toil, you know, that, that um, brutally and for free, you know? So, I mean, there's a lot of conceptual considerations there, but I'm more interested in what you think, you know, when you see it, when you watch it. But thank you for the question, though. There's actually a part two of the question and um, that I think is especially related to the way you're working now on the new thing. Um, she adds, um, and in creating work, thinking about how it would work in a gallery space versus a theater or now at home. The question is? The question is, are you, do you, are you thinking about space when you're conceiving the work, whether it's a gallery space or a theater, or now are you thinking about people, especially watching um, like this? Yeah, I, I, I'm one of those people who really thinks that, you know, I think that there's still, I hope that there's still a life for cinema, you know, like cinemas where we go and we collectively sit in the dark and we watch things. Cause I think that's something special. I think something special happens there. So I definitely am still making my work with that future in mind that we will one day be able to enter back into a cinema. Um, but still understanding that right now, you know, accessibility as it relates to the internet is it's high, it's good. Like if you can get on, and you can log on and you have the desire to see something and it's available to you, then, then you can make it happen. But I'm not making work for a laptop. You know, I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about the cinema and I'm thinking about the gallery space. You know, how can I fill this space uh, and make it, when I'm when thinking through a gallery space, how can it be immersive to where it's going a step further than the cinema? What sort of art objects am I bringing into this space? 
What is the light doing? How are the projections even installed? They're not simply just flat walls. If it is a flat wall, what else is on the wall? Is the projection at an angle? Is it at a slant? Um, are there, you know, for the three channel, there were altars in this space. There were two altars for the Orisha, you know? So it's about creating an environment and the space itself becomes a material. We're trying to activate the atmosphere. So it's not just about what's being projected. It's everything that's moving, you know, everything that's included and involved in the terrain, you know? I hope that makes sense. Absolutely, it's a beautiful answer. Um, there's a question from Laura. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about the role of spirituality, both in terms of content, but also in terms of the process of production and implications for black liberation and revolutionary possibility. Wow, okay. <laughs> That's a question. That's a heavy um, question. That's a good question. I mean, listen, I am the daughter of Pentecostal preachers, the granddaughter of them too. And I'm no longer like a practicing Pentecostal evangelical. I am something much more, you know, kind of ancient and primordial. I've mentioned the altars in the space. There are altars in my home. Um, and, you know, a connection with the spirit realm, this is going to sound very woo-woo-woo, but it is what it is. It's central, not only to my creative process, but to my life. You know, there are rituals involved. Uh, there are peti There's petitioning that has to happen even before we can move on to the next step. I feel like the things that are inside of me are gifts. The ideas that come out of me, those are gifts. Uh, as they take shape and become actual films, those are offerings. So it's not simply just, again, this kind of uh, personal aggrandizement, me trying to, you know, be that girl. These are, this is, this is the, the mandate. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, even if I, you know, wanted to do something else, I wouldn't be able to, you know, this is, it is what it is. So in, in, uh, in doing this work, I'm honoring uh, a kind of ancestral tradition of storytelling, uh, an ancestral tradition of, you know, may, way makers and ritualists and spiritualists. So it is profoundly important that I acknowledge these folks, that I acknowledge these entities during the process uh, and with the works. Um, so as I mentioned in the previous answer, there were altars in the actual installation space. Um, to Yemaya and Oshun, which are Orishas who are part of my life and who have, you know, blessed me, you know, in, immeasurably. So I, of course, acknowledge and salute them, even in the film. At the beginning of the film and the end of the film, you see these animations, direct animations on 16 millimeter film. You see water, you see waterfalls, you see the Atlantic Ocean, you see the Mississippi River, and you see a bunch of symbols that I've etched. Uh, these symbols are, of course, in reference to and gesturing towards these exact same Orisha, Yemaya and Oshun. So these, and, and there's a song that's playing, it's called How Can I Lose? And the woman singing is Shirley um, Lee, and she's saying, how can I lose with the help I've got, right? So this is me acknowledging these, these deities, these spirits, um, and the help that they've given me. So, you know, I, we can I can complain, but I won't, you know, I can talk about the things that haven't been given to me, but I won't because there's been so much that has been given to me. And so the work is of course an offering. Me as a, as a, as a creator, I'm a conduit and I'm grateful for that, um, that positioning and that mandate and that responsibility. Beautiful answer. Um, okay, there's one more question, and then I, I think I didn't we're hit on the grid. really quickly. Sorry. I, oh I yes, please. Very. I'll just say this because I'm asked to speak about liberation a lot. People really want me to go in. I will say that I, you know I stand in solidarity with folks who are abolitionists for folks who are daring to make radical demands in this moment and who are not simply settling for a representational politic that surfaced, but they're actually making radical demands for how we can transform our entire way of being. And I think, I know, I beseech them to understand that spirituality has a place in those efforts. They must acknowledge spirit 
in addition to the past, in addition to political education, in addition to the organizing traditions, in addition to the self-defense tradition, we should also recognize that spirit has a place in that. Spirit has been useful in Black people throughout history, liberating themselves from the clutches of oppressive violence. Well, Next thank question. you for the question, Laura, and thank you for that answer, Jatavia. Um, so the last question is, uh, I really love the moment when you get, uh, this is from Kayla, I really love the moment when you get onto the teens not respecting their elder and yelling as they walk past while you're talking with her. And I just love to hear you discuss, um, she'd love to hear you discuss elders and how they're present in your work. Wow, that's a good one. Um, Listen, I am um, beyond anything. I'm, I'm a country girl, you know, I was raised a certain way. And so, you know, even though I'm like kind of brash and, you know, anti-respectability politics, there's a certain way that I was taught uh, to engage with people who are older than me. Uh, yes, ma'am, no ma'am, miss, sister, so-and-so, brother, so-and-so, you know, there's a certain way uh, of engaging with people and, understanding that elders are bringing for so much wisdom, so much knowledge and so much information, right? And just their lived embodiment, their lived experience. So it was really important for me to make sure that I had them as part of the interviews, right? Because it's gonna give us a kind of wide understanding, not just like the young girls, because the young girls have their own experience, right? Many of them didn't feel safe because of course they're being realized at a rate that the older women are not. But it was important for me to think about this, what the older women are bringing. And a lot of it was this kind of like spiritual connection again, you know, like I feel safe because, you know, I, I walk with God, you know, or, you know, I know my surroundings. Um, and to me, it, it is a goal. A goal of mine is to be an old black woman, you know, <laughs> old knowledgeable black woman who, you know, is fresh out of fucks to give, you know, says what she wants and is emboldened by having survived. So to me, anytime I can speak with these folks, anytime I can have them on camera delivering their truths, it's important for me to do so because the intergenerational conversation has to be strengthened. If we're going to get out of this, we need to be able to hear them and they need to be able to hear us because there's much to learn from each other. And I feel like there's a chasm there. Um, so it, it's important for me to, to, to make sure that there is some sort of bridge over that chasm. Mm, that's a lovely place to end. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time and your thoughts, yeah. Jatavia. Um, and thank uh -huh. you for helping us kick off the festival with this lovely chat. Um, thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Uh, we'll care. be back. Bye. We'll be back again at 7 p.m. tomorrow for an interview with Unapologetic. Uh, uh, director Ashley O'Shea. Um, yeah. Oh, did you know her? <laughs> yeah. Great. Oh, great. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much again. Thank you.